Welcome to Biblical Insights with David Gooding, a Myrtlefield House podcast. When we study scripture, we ask two basic questions. What does it say? Why does it say it? What I'm doing, therefore, is looking for what I would call the thought flow. This is not just a philosophical theory. This gospel actually works. Let me tell God what I think of God. Let God so long as God be mine. In many ways, the book of Revelation is a solemn book with its depictions of tribulation and judgment. But what hope does it offer the human race? What does it tell us about how God will claim victory over sin and unbelief? In episode 9, Dr. Gooding argues that lasting peace and prosperity will not be achieved by merely human governments, and that for humanity to enjoy the paradise it longs for, Christ must return and reign. Please join us as the lessons of Revelation challenge us to make a choice to be on the Lord's side as we come to appreciate the fairness of God's judgments and the glory of his final victory. I suspect that there is not one single man, woman, boy, or child that doesn't in his heart hope that one day the problems of our world will be solved. In the ancient prophet Isaiah, God talks to us of a coming day when the nations shall beat their swords into pruning hawks, their spears into plow. Nations shall learn war no more. There shall come a glorious reign of peace and prosperity. And as we read that kind of thing in our Old Testament, most of us at any rate sense immediately a sympathy with it. War is a stupid thing, isn't it? Here we are, sophisticated modern men and women who can peer into the very secrets of nature. And yet, facing us are endless possible terror because of the human heart, because of the threat of war. In spite of all our sophistication, while half the world is fed, the other half starves. And we say in our hearts, oh, that one day somebody might find the secret of putting this world right and the whole world enter into a time of peace and of plenty. The Bible assures us that that time of peace and plenty shall come. But then the Bible tells us quite bluntly how it will come. The Bible's view of things is this, that this, our world, is so deeply injured that there is no hope of that coming age of peace and plenty until the Lord Jesus come and smash every form of human government and putting it on the side, take over the reins of universal government himself what the theologians call the apocalyptic view of the future. I repeat, its view is that the institutions of this world, its governments, its economics, its commerce, that these things are so fatally flawed at their heart that in the end God shall himself shall not be able to improve them. They will have to be destroyed by the coming of the Lord Jesus and in its place he shall set up his kingdom. Now, I don't know how you react to that promise of the Bible and to its diagnosis. I have plenty of friends who, when they hear it, shake their heads in disgust, do not in despair. And they say to me, yes, of course we're looking for a golden age, but your view is so gloomy. You know, it despises all the improvements and the progress that mankind has made all down the century. If your view is right, we might as well pack up trying. Go and sit on a mountain somewhere, like some extreme cults do, and hope for the coming of the Lord Jesus next Tuesday, or at least in a month's time or something. And therefore, men and women are not inclined to believe it. They say, that's, that's too like Jeremiah. That's too gloomy, that view. 
that the only hope for our world is the coming of Christ and the replacement by his government. They said, that's far too gloomy. We can't have it. And so they go on hoping and hoping and hoping that the present uh, progress that humankind has made, and it's made a lot, hasn't it, will sometime, give it enough thousands of years, will sometime at last reach the glorious age of peace and plenty. Well, now God takes us by the hand in his prophets and shows us that if that is our hope, uh, then we are mightily deceived. Why is it? Let's hear, first of all, what the prophet Daniel has to say. And when we've heard him for ten minutes, then we shall listen to the Apostle John and hear what he's got to say to the beast. And it won't be the same lesson. Of course, it won't contradict the first lesson, but the two of them together will form a very balanced view of it. So Daniel talks to us about the beast. And when Daniel talks about the beast, it's part of God's critique with past and present and future governments in this world, and particularly imperialist government. In chapter 7 of Daniel, then God likens these empires to wild beasts. We'll come to that in a minute. But God is fair, you know, and reasonable. And in chapter 2 of the prophecy by Daniel, God gives us another picture of those world empires. And in chapter 2 of Daniel's prophecy, he doesn't uh, describe them as beasts. He describes them as a beautiful, glorious image of a man. God has two pictures of Gentile government in the prophecy of Daniel, one in chapter 2 and one in chapter 7. You see, God is reasonable, isn't he? Let's take the first vision first. How does God look upon the governments of our world? Well, I'll tell you, says God. And he gave to King Nebuchadnezzar, emperor of Babylon, a view of the governments of the world from one point of view as God sees them. And Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. He saw this image standing on the plain of Dura. And in his dream, you know what dreams are like, he couldn't think he'd put it there, and he never ordered it to be there. And what artist in his academy had gone and built such a, an image like this? It was a tremendous image. The head was of gold, and the breast was of silver, and the thighs were of copper, and the legs were of iron, and the feet were of iron plus clay. And as Nebuchadnezzar looked at this, what first struck him first was, it was the image of a man, a very big man. So big, it was almost frightening to look at. You know, a man about six foot and up, isn't he? Uh, six foot six, well, he's getting rather big. A uh, man is a vast colossus when man gets very big, and he begins to get frightened, doesn't he? And Nebuchadnezzar saw this colossal of a man. He was to learn this is human government as God sees it. Mighty and brilliant. Head of gold, chest of silver, thighs of copper, legs of iron. And that was God being fair, isn't it? Thanks to all sorts of moves in civilization and particularly among the Greeks with their political theorizing of the Babylonians. We've inherited an enormous achievement. Oh, thank God for it. A magnificent achievement of humankind in the development of government, in trying this kind of government and that kind of government. Still in this country, at least, we think we've hit upon the best that is possible before the Lord comes, a kind of democracy. And you say to me, well, there you are, Mr. Preacher. Now you're admitting what my viewpoint is, you see. Uh, we've progressed so far. Admittedly, we've got some difficult people, according to your political uh, persuasions. But... Uh, Give us a few more hundred years. Shall we uh, at last come to a perfect world government and we shall all live in peace and prosperity? And the answer is no, you won't. Why not? Well, Daniel, as he had to point out to Nebuchadnezzar, that marvelous image of a man that stood for Gentile government. Its feet were iron and clay, which won't mix. 
there was a weakness that was liable to topple any minute. As I read that vision, I take it as a parable to myself, whatever else it means. Man has achieved a tremendous amount, hasn't he? But uh, I think even you will recognize man has a hidden weakness, hasn't he? A fatal flaw. I know I have. I don't know about you. You should hear me Monday mornings when I get up. And the dim light of dawn reminds me that another day has come. Ah, I say to myself, now goody, out of bed, goody. And uh, I'm very good at governing and laying down the law. I say, goody, you shall do this today and that today, and you won't be so stupid as you were last week, and you will do God's law, and you will keep it, and you'll behave very well to your aunts and your uh, uh, brothers and sisters and your students and all the rest. You will, you will, you will keep the law. Then I find I've got a fatal flaw, and I have to say with another old wretched man that I am, the good I would do, and the evil I don't want to do, that I do. And you say, why do you behave so crazily like that, Gooding? I say, sir, it's because ultimately I am a fallen man. I come of a fallen race, born in rebellion to God. I find even my own body and mind is not perfectly obedient even to me. I'm like a prisoner in my own castle. And what is true of the individual is true of nations. If you come inside a nation, the government might be quite right, but we don't always obey it, do we? We mean to, but we don't. And when it comes to international relationships, plagued by this weakness that the Bible calls sin. Not until an answer is found to that weakness, is there any real permanent hope of an age of peace and plenty? The answer to that weakness, of course, is to be found in the supernatural power of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Today God waits because today God is working on individuals. Coming to me in my problem over sin and weakness, the fact that I cannot keep his law and deserve eternal death for it and offering me salvation and a new birth and supernatural power of God in being born again. One day he shall come in power and great glory, and he will insist on putting the nations right. There shall come the political regeneration when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory. Ah, uh, yes, but if in Daniel 2, God shows us one aspect of Gentile power, and chooses to emphasize the glory of man and man's achievement in government, but that glory uh, flawed, fatally flawed by man's inherent weakness. In chapter 7 of Daniel, God gives us another view, and here comes our beast. He's one of four. He's the last of four. They're all wild beasts, but he's the worst beast among the whole lot of them. Wild beasts, says God. You say, is God Almighty being unfair and unkind and rude about human government? Well, ladies and gentlemen, you must make an effort to try and understand the term. Yes, in some sense, governments are animals, aren't they? You say, whatever do you mean? Well, let me take an example. Um, it's not wise of you to take a lion as a pet, you know. You can do it. Uh, you have to keep a lion in your backyard and you, when he's nicely fed and he's had all he wants to drink and he uh, can't eat any more anyway, then you could go along and coax him and whisper sweet nothings in his ear and twizzle his tail and he'll be nice to you and he'll smile at you in a way that lions smile sometimes. But you wouldn't mistake it. Seems to be friendly today. That's because he doesn't want anything. If tomorrow there was a meat shortage and uh, you both, you and the lion, had run out of meat, uh, and uh, you had a little bit of meat and he had none. He wouldn't say please, because he's an animal. He grabbed the meat that you got and you as well and eat both. And he wouldn't apologize afterwards either. Why is that? Because he's an animal. 
He has no sense of morality. He doesn't proceed on any sense of morality. He's just an animal. You don't expect your father to have moral judgment, do you? He's an animal. And I must tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that if uh, today America has enough oil to keep her constitution going, well, she'll be friendly. Supposed by some hap, America ran out of oil and all her economy was threatened. And nobody, the Britons nor the Russians, would sever any. What do you suppose America would do? Sit down and die? No, I tell you straight, they'd come and take your oil. And they wouldn't apologize either. Why? Because governments are like animals, says God. They are not immoral, but they are amoral. Survival is the name of the game. And they're going to survive by moral wins if they can, but if they can't, they're going to survive. And the biggest animal wins. Ah, but you say, surely, Mr. Preacher, that's a gloomy view as well. Haven't governments become more humane and tolerant in modern times? They have indeed, ladies and gentlemen. And God foresaw they would too. In Daniel chapter 7, when he talks about the beasts, he pictures number one beast, for instance, the Babylonian beast. And it was a lion, and it had eagle wings on its back. And says, John, I saw until its wings were clipped, and it was made to stand up on two legs like a, like a man, the lion of hell. And a man's heart was given it. In other words, it became humanized. That's happened to many governments. It's happened to the British government in my lifetime. In my time, at least, in my youth, used to see children running about naked and half fed. Don't see it now. There was no compassionate health service or anything. There is some kind of health service now, isn't there? In my country, if you'd stolen a sheep, or a horse, in the early 1800s, you'd have got hung for it. You won't get hung for it now, not even if you steal the Queen's Rolls Royce. We've become more humane, haven't we? You say, give us a time, give us a chance, and, and in the end, we'll bring in the age of peace. No, you won't. No, you won't, says God. For consider that while governments have become more humane, consider that fourth beast, if you will. And what about him? Ah, he got the eyes of a man and the mouth of a man, but not the heart of a man. Just you imagine that. If the lions could unlock the secrets of nature and was, had such intelligence that they could discover the atom and the atom bomb, what should we do? Now we're at a time when men have done just like that with human insight into the very secrets of nature. Governments have it in their power to destroy the whole world. And they're animals still. You see, ladies and gentlemen, if you'd have come to this country from abroad to beat us up, like old William the Conqueror did, we should have come out to you with bows and arrows. And if you got too near, we should have clucked your head to pulp with an old cudgel. You come to Britain now to attack us. We shan't fight you with bows and arrows because we're civilized. We shall irradiate you, eliminate you. We're civilized. And we see now, as two generations before us have seen, this fearful combination of the models of an animal coupled with human insight into nature. The result in the fourth beast was that it was exceedingly destructive. It stamped and it bit. God himself had to intervene to, to destroy it for the sake of the survival of the human race. Hear the gospel. You who stand under the shadow of the atomic bomb and what the nations will do. God has his answer. One day the beast of Gentile imperialism will be burned and the government shall be handed over to the Son of Man according to God's books of rational account. And his divine wisdom is hair like white as wool. 
will decree that the government of this world shall be in the hands of the perfect human, Jesus, the Son of Man, and the government be given to the same. The Lord is coming. What a lovely thing. And what a hope. Thank you for listening to Biblical Insights with David Gooding. If you're interested in more of Dr. Gooding's teachings, check out our other podcast series or visit our website, murfieldhouse.com, for free ebooks, sermons, and study notes.